It's November 10th, 2019. This is episode 137 of Fancy Ramen. Today we cover Toby Fox's battle theme in Pokemon Sword and Shields. Uh, I got a new project. Scott gets a massage, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, there are some slight kind of spoilers for Jojo Rabbit, the Nazi movie. Uh, I talk about Luigi's Mansion, Cookie. Expl- uh, explains Pistol Whip and Ring Fit Adventure. We got an action-packed episode today. Please enjoy. How about we just uh, use that on the on the on intro, the intro, and then get copy struck? Yeah, let's just get. <laughs> if we ever have an episode that is particularly bad, um, we can always just cue up that <laughs> excuse that we got hit with the cease and desist. <laughs> so uh, we put out the content, but unfortunately, we can't provide it to you because our our legal team, which is Cookie, um, says that that would be an unwise decision. Correct. I just played like the first eight seconds of it. And you already know. It doesn't sound like Pokemon at all. Tiff, Tiff and I share the same opinion. It doesn't sound like Pokemon at all. I know, is, but it does sound like a Toby Fox joint. That is definitely not Pokemon. All right. Tiff said it's a good song, but I'm not willing to make that. There's, I think actually it has more of the Pokemon vibe to it once you're at least like 20, 30 seconds in. Like there start to be sort of some flourishes and like structure that uh make it seem at least a little closer to that he is but the instruments the truth and the tempo and like pretty much like the the primary aspects of the song absolutely would be uh indistinguishable from like an undertale uh soundtrack like playlist if i listened to a playlist of undertale i'd be like i don't remember this song but i'm sure it was in the game yeah it it would have me convinced it's the use of these synthesizers and like the the synthesized horns that no one ever uses to make believable horns anymore if that makes sense oh absolutely because they don't sound like believable horns it's it's the constant happening in the uh, in the rhythm section. How are uh, you on rhythm with my playthrough, my playback? <laughs> oh, wait, was I on? <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good job. It, it's kind of it's kind of weird because like I I think he's a good composer, uh, and I oh, yeah. like I like a lot of his music. But listening to this track makes me realize that he might be very singularly focused he has, as a he composer. Has a niche. Yeah. Like realizing all ACDC does is rock anthems, that sort of thing. Rock. Yeah, but ACDC decided to write a song for Frozen. And then it is basically just the same anthem. thing as TNT and Dog Eat Dog and Dynamite. Dirty Deeds, Dun Dirt Cheat. TNT, dun, whatever the fuck it is, I don't know. I'm dynamite, and I'm ready to fight. Yeah, they I, all sound the same. They they are uh, they are all the same. That said, like he has versatility as a composer, but this song, not saying it is technically a sort of like called in attempt. Is that the term? Like uh, we're phoning it in. Yeah, I phoning. think you want it phoning it in. It kind of feels like it's a phoned in, a phoned in thing here. I mean, it's it's got some cool little parts to it, but it sounds. Or pretty... he just. I feel like maybe he just sold a lost track. He's like, this has been sitting on my hard drive. They want me to compose something. Here you go. Yeah, maybe. And I I realize there's not a whole lot you can do in one minute and thirteen seconds, but. Like Rude Buster is about that same amount of time, and that's the battle theme from Delta Rune, and that's like a really good song. Yeah. Which uses significantly simpler voicings and uh, synth parts. Is everybody recording? I probably should have asked this. About yeah, I've, four I've been recording. Ago. 
I've got uh, five minutes and 22 seconds on my recording. Six minutes cool, so and four seconds. So this is all permanent. Oh. <laughs> this is all usable. Well, it's all based off of the four minutes and uh, 20 seconds that I have in. So. Oh, so we were all prepared, but you the least prepared Ish. out of all of us. <laughs> Ish, yeah. <laughs> Somewhat prepared. Actually, I think that would be... Uh, a pretty good definition of my like general state of being always somewhat prepared, never completely off guard, never, uh, never 100% on the ball. Well, uh, if it's not obvious, I'm back in town. I was out for the majority of this week for work. Mm -hmm. I got sick because I was traveling and planes are filthy fucking things. You need to shop, stop shaking the hands of all your fans. <laughs> I need to stop, uh, Stop licking armrests and trays, <laughs> airplane trays. I told you that wouldn't make you that much stronger. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I don't know why I found that funny. <laughs> yeah, what have you guys been up to? I started a new project. Is it the music or is it not the music? It is the music, actually. Uh, so yesterday, I sat down for six hours and came up with three songs that I am kind of enjoying the sound of. So I'm releasing them as my uh, as my six six hour EP, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to take another six six hours to write and record lyrics to them, and then I'm going to take twelve hours to record three music videos, and it's going to be called the twenty four hour. Le Mans collaboration. <laughs> Three music videos? Three music videos in 12 hours. I mean, one music video in 12 hours is already too much. It's, yeah. Yep. I'm going for it. After you watched, uh, after you participated in our 24-hour uh, film festival thing, which I, I don't think I sent to Scott yet. No, I haven't gotten to Which see it yet. I haven't cleaned up the audio yet on like what we were going to make a you know nicer presentation of it, like a more polished version of it. Well, I'll don't see. send me a mediocre product. I want full polish here. Well, I mean, I I figure you'd be fine with watching the outcome of the twenty four hours of effort, which it turned out to be fine. Yeah, but after after witnessing that, I figured you'd probably decide not to ever attempt something like that in your life cookie but <laughs> oh this was like the third or fourth time i've been called randomly uh -huh. in to do to be a dead body on a or get i think i've been shot once stabbed once just walking by as like a dancing extra and then strangled once so is it because you're black that you've had to mainly. keep dying on screen mm -hmm. mainly I would have I would have liked to see the um, see that cut of me walking away from him because I was walking away way too calmly after seeing a dead body. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's that's what I got. That's that's what I got out of that. It was just oh man, I just saw a dead body. Man, I am calm. <laughs> You're like I don't care about this bathroom anymore. I'm gonna find a new bathroom. <laughs> I, f I felt like a video game character, just like oh, who's that? Walk calmly away. <laughs> we we don't have the. Uh, a model of you with a frantic face and a walking <laughs> animation. So we had to recall that specific regular normal walking animation. It happens. Um, but yeah, no, decided to do a little more something in music. I finally officially say the door is now finished for our, um, our bathroom door mm -hmm. because now it's got little a guiding roller at the bottom to keep it from knocking against the door being like pushed out far and it now closes on center. Like it stops centered with the hole in our wall. And it only opens just enough to be a fully open door. So it's mm. no longer just going all a, over the a place. A big really slide nothing. along the wall. Yeah. Yeah. That's about been my life. It also does. It has that, uh, you know, now uh, it has the pressurized seal now too. So you can lock someone in with their juices, right? Yeah, basically, because there's only like a few millimeters clearance at the very bottom of the thing. Mm -hmm. It's nice. It's real crispy. I like <laughs> it. 
Scott? Um, let's see. This week, the most interesting thing that's happened to me is I got to experience for the first time and due to the cost, probably for the only time in a long while, a professional full body massage. And I feel like a new man. I was treated like a slab of meat for about 90 minutes and the number of knots that I have de- that I had developed in my body and my muscles was honestly terrifying to me as they each got worked out like piece by piece. But now I, I feel fresh and rejuvenated and it was a spiritual experience to not feel like some gross contortion of muscle anymore. Did they... Uh- the- play music and burn oils or whatever there wasn't any oil burning but there was that there was the type of music that you'd find in like any like mindfulness yoga studio style thing which i just kind of like filter out because it's just it's just like changing the uh like chord progression over and over it's like just changing key slightly and then back and so it's it's all the uh like i don't know it it builds anticipation then immediately resolves it and then it does it again and it resol- and it just over and over. I, I don't like that kind of music very much. I mean I, I like the Minecraft it's hard. soundtrack. You're more <laughs> you're more the Lil John and the East Side boys, huh? Yeah. You want to get that crunk music. I mean Yeah <laughs> There you so, go. <laughs> um Yeah, I definitely clipped way too hard on that one. <laughs> oh my god. Do you think if you provided so the masseuse with my own beats yeah if they would play them so i do have um the next time i go i will have this uh like 24 hour project which is three music videos (laughs) (laughs) over (laughs) over a 24 hour period um no that would be interesting i would be interested in like submitting that because i think it would be fun to uh get massaged to like just a tame impala album like if we're gonna go into this sort of like psychedelic trippy space why don't we just go all the way and have some like really nice like bass lines worked in there but uh it was like i got the hot stones which uh those are hot like holy shit there were a couple times where i was like i think my skin might burn if this uh like if i get any longer amount of contact time with these hot stones but it it was nice it was nice overall and at the end of it um i just wasn't ready for how hot the hot stones actually are you never are you never are i was i was not um but yeah no like oil infusions or anything uh just essentially like someone like cranking out all of the just like almost like tumor like masses of muscle like contortions in my body like i think what was it they were telling the um person was telling me like sometimes if we encounter like a really difficult area it's like we'll work on it and then we have to move away so the muscle can relax and we'll go back to work on it on my like shoulders i think they returned like six or seven times total because and it was just the same spot over and over just like trying to loosen it up more and more i had like literally a ball in my on both sides of my shoulders that they had to work out um and now i'm gonna take that uh that and turn it into ultimate performance for tennis for the next couple days before i uh completely undo all of the hard work that my masseuse uh put into getting me relaxed you know your uh, health insurance might actually cover trips to uh, a massage therapist or masseuse. Yeah, I'm sure good it, health insurance would do that. <laughs> <laughs> Which I take you take it you do no, not have. No, there's yeah, I, I do not have good health insurance anymore. When I was working, you know, when I was working for a uh, university and a hospital now that was that was some primo health insurance but the stuff i have now um is substantially less uh it's substantially lower quality than what i had previously less comprehensive less comprehensive is absolutely it domage that's about it yeah i didn't uh yeah say domage uh but 
that's about all all I've been up to outside of the like or at least in the interesting realm of non gaming material. Well, uh, why don't we get into it then? Absolutely. Cool. Well, ne- God, you said gaming material, so that just completely shut out my my JoJo adventure that I had. Today. Oh, oh, no, we yeah, should talk right. about that actually. <laughs> As long as you don't spoil, well, actually, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you spoil anything for me because JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Adventure, Adventure Part Nine, <laughs> yeah, um, somehow so. takes place in the same period of time as Part Two. Part, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that would be about that time period. No, well, I, it I, makes I, sense if you get far enough into JoJo, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Scott cautiously and nervously laughs. Because <laughs> I do, I know <laughs> it's true though. That's because <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> oh, so yes, I went to see JoJo today. Uh, JoJo Rabbit, not a bizarre adventure at all. Well, it was kind of a bizarre adventure. Um. Lizzie was asking me before we went to go see this, like what the critical reviews were for this. Is mm-hmm. it still like really polarizingly split? Do we know? I don't. I don't know exactly. I think the last time I saw a Rotten Tomatoes number on it, it was like close to eighty percent or something. Uh, which isn't. I mean, that's not necessarily critical reviews, right? Because Rotten yeah. Tomatoes does have okay seventy nine percent tomato meter audience is ninety seven percent. It, it might 90, be pertinent to yeah. like summarize or give us a a good summary of what what this movie is because when I look at the box art or the the uh, movie poster for it, it looks like a Wes Anderson film. Mm-hmm. It's basically a Wes Anderson film, but not. <laughs> um, so you are following a ten year old boy named Jojo throughout the. It spans about half a year, the last last little bit of the um, World War II. Yeah, that was the Germany one, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, both wo- World Wars actually had Germany involved <laughs> in them, but... Uh, worlds. <laughs> but anyway, um, so you're following a, a little boy throughout his summer in the last years of um, World War II, and he is your idealistic Nazi kid. Uh, everything is Hail Hitler. He, his imaginary friend is just a reincarnation of Hitler. Mm-hmm. And... Or not reincarnation, but uh, conceptualization. Oh, a, conceptual, yeah. Thank you. A conceptualization of Hitler. And he has a Jew living in his attic. And the very beginning kind of really does play up that whole, like... So they're always talking about, like, Oh, mad what can Jews do? And they're like saying they can read minds and hypnotize people and they drink blood and like all these like horror stories of Jews are basically vampires for whatever reason. I was going to say that sounds like vampires. Yeah. And so when he discovers the chick living in his, living in his attic, or I guess it's a crawl space in his uh, deceased sister's room. He like, it really has like, really has like horrific elements there mm-hmm. the interaction between the two kids uh the the jewish chick and the main character the interaction is very um like tense and the movie is funny and sad all at the same time like mm-hmm. it's basically following the outcasts so they're just normal people living their life um the son is a fanatic the mother obviously is a sympathizer i.e hiding a jewish teenager in her home at the height of the revolution but jojo is he's a good kid and his um, friend, I forgot what his friend's name was called. Um, he's like a little fat kid. He, mm-hmm. Their interactions are just hilarious. Like sometimes just due to what's being said and what's being talked about, you kind of forget that, oh yeah, they're kids. And then you, you see their 
you see those two friends interact with each other. It's like at the very towards like the very end of the movie, it's like the friends like, ah, oh, it's a bad time to be a Nazi. <laughs> I'm gonna go home. I need a cuddle. <laughs> it's just like, oh, that's great. Uh, the art direction for some of the shots was phenomenal. Uh, not giving much away, I guess, but like it kind of felt. Who's the guy who's really obsessed with feet? It's Tarantino, feet? right? Oh, that's Tarantino. Yeah, yeah. So it had like this thing, like so lots much, of lots of foot shots, huh? Pretty much every shot that introduced um JoJo's mom, played by Scarlett Johansson, was of her shoes. Hmm. So it'd be like, hey, this is these are her feet these are the shoes that she's wearing. Then it'd be like, hey, remember those sh- cute shoes she was wearing? Mm-hmm. She's still wearing those shoes. Cool. Jojo can't tie shoes. Jojo can't tie his shoes is like a big thing. So by the end of the movie, of course, he now can tie shoes. But That's the big character development is him not like rejecting Nazi propaganda, but instead learning how to <laughs> tie a shoelace. Yes, <laughs> very much so. Um, but yeah, no, it's a... It's a great movie. There's um, some things of like, oh no, they're going to get caught. And then they don't. And you find out that people are like allies, but maybe they're not allies. So you don't, you can't really tell a book by its, judge a book by its cover. Even though that cover was incredibly gay. The cover was incredibly gay. This is, uh, you're not spoiling anything for me, but honestly, you are like actively confusing me as to what, <laughs> yeah, what the plot of the movie is at all. So, so I don't okay, get it. So, is his so, imaginary friend version of Hitler his stand? Yes. <laughs> at, at points, his stand does interact with the world, <laughs> if that makes you feel better. Um, so, synopsis of the movie is you were following a boy through a coming-of-age story in the middle of Nazi Germany who just wants to fit in. Mm -hmm. And things take a turn for the nice in a very sad way. Hmm. All I can say, slight spoilers, Hitler shoots himself in the head. Oh, well, I... uh, I mean, I didn't know that. (laughs) What? (laughs) What? I thought he but, was in Venezuela. Yeah, are you telling me they lose? <laughs> oh, don't worry. He comes back to life with a bullet wound in his head. Hence the oh. in the stand, so it's fine. <laughs> in- interesting. Rebel and Mark spoilers, just in case. Yeah. Oh, okay. If you want spoilers, I can I can tell you about some like the conversations. I I don't want spoilers. I'm gonna okay. watch it. When, All I can uh, say is the conversations between the characters. Hmm are just brilliant um when hitler's talking to the kid it's like one of the gags is he offers him a cigarette Mm -hmm. and jojo's like i'm 10 i don't smoke (laughs) and then like stressful things happen so hitler keeps offering him cigarettes and he's like why are you still offering me cigarettes and it's just like what do we do and it just sounds like natural conversations like Mm -hmm. it felt as if the guy who was playing Hitler literally was just like the kid was just literally thrust into a situation giving natural dialogue and then him and Hitler would have just like a conversation recap Mm -hmm. and it just felt like exactly what would be said by a 10 year old at that time okay or at least what would be going on in a 10 year old's mind Right, and so uh, Taika Waititi, who who is the director and is is playing uh, like Hitler. the imaginary friend Hitler, yeah, he is uh, like in these scenes with JoJo's character, like he's embodying the uh, concept of Hitler to ten year old JoJo, who's been indoctrinated by like the Hitler Youth movement. Yeah. So yeah, he's not like he's not actually like serious mean literally like hyped up on amphetamines hitler that we know of like historical context but he's he's 10 year old's concept of fun and goofy and uh slightly erratic hitler very much so as one of the scenes for the like that was in the actual trailer 
was mm-hmm. after they see the Jew girl, they're like, what do we do? The boy is like, we should negotiate. And Hitler says, we should burn down the house and blame Winston Churchill. Mm. Or negotiate. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> that also works too. But nah, it's, if you need to, if you're going to go see that, I highly suggest you see the movie. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful movie that I may end up just owning just to further support that movie. I'm very picky about the movies that I actually buy because mm-hmm. I know I'm not going to watch them ever and they'll all end up on Netflix anyway. But this one definitely deserves a little more money out of me. Well, I'm I'm a big fan of uh, Taika Waititi. I haven't seen a movie I haven't enjoyed of his yet. If you haven't seen it, and you like this, you should check out Hunt for the Wilder People. That's a very good mm-hmm. one. Um, it's another pseudo coming of age story. Like, uh, essentially, it's about a uh, troubled boy who gets adopted by a family that lives like on the outskirts of the bush in New Zealand, and um, it's like his. I I guess it's like his his development in the coming of age story, but also his like fostering a relationship with this very grouchy uh, and like disinterested old man who is uh, one of his caretakers, who is one of his guardians. I guess very very fun and interesting movie. Nice, yeah, oh, dude. He did the Thor movies. Cool. He did Ragnarok. I think that's the only one. And he actually the the little rock monster or the stone guy in Thor Ragnarok is voiced by him. Oh, that makes total yeah. sense. He's also going to be very, doing very um, funny. The, he's going to be doing the next one as well. He did oh, cool. Eagle versus Shark. Nice. He's if the you, most pre- preeminent Kiwi director, I believe. Nope, I like it. God, I need to like find these costumes for Eagle versus Shark and dress up with Lizzie. Great movie. Anyway, nope, I like it. I really enjoyed the movie. Matter of fact, everything I've seen by him I've really liked, which is Eagle vs. Shark. I never saw Green Lantern, so you know, I get to skip that. <laughs> <laughs> Thor, Ragnarok, and Jojo Rabbit so far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Neil, did you get any uh, gaming done while you were on your long hiatus from the pod? Not really. I uh, worked an awful lot um oh no need to brag <laughs> so much work uh but outside of that uh counting the time i was back in omaha i've played a lot more uh or a little actually i don't know if i've talked about it on the podcast at all uh to begin with but i've been playing luigi's mansion Ooh, how uh, is the that? third one yes the new third one so i've never played the first two so take take that into consideration uh but i'm i'm enjoying it so far um to really quickly point out there are a few things that like jumped out at me that were like ghosts and other other and uh, some other jump scares spooky yes. characters yeah now there, there are a few like bad things that i want to point out maybe because it's easier to point them out than highlight all of the good things if that's mm-hmm. you know a sign of how well how much i'm enjoying the game uh, some of the load times are pretty obvious, and it mostly goes with uh, being in the elevator and changing floors. I, I know it's kind of maybe ex- expecting like better performance out of this game that looks really nice, but is on a switch. But going from floor like eight to seven or seven to six just sometimes feels like it's taking too long and that's definitely covering up for load times loading in the new environment and so Mm -hmm. forth um how how often are you switching from floors to is it something that it's like you're kind of spending a decent amount of time on each floor or is it really forcing you to like are you navigate multiple levels are you trying to get from floor to seven to two all at once well, so, I don't think don't, that would matter on the loading, right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. It won't matter if you go from the first floor to the top floor, as far as I can tell, or at least the top available floor. Um, okay. It really hasn't been a problem until this last bit we were playing. We actually had a point where we needed to go down a floor to catch an apparition that had gone through the floor in mm. order to escape us. But usually the game does a good job of keeping all of its play like uh all of its uh like chapter 
on one floor. So there's generally not a whole lot of load, like off screen load time, we'll say, that occurs mm-hmm. when you're playing the game. And usually, like each floor tends to, each quote unquote floor, there can tend to be levels within that floor or like floors within that floor, if that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> but it generally does a good job of keeping you on one floor. Uh, so that means really minimizing the impact that loading has on a current play, like a, a, a current play session. But that did come up this last, this last floor we were on. We had to go to the, to the one below it, and mm-hmm. um, I I think that's the only reason why it really stood uh, stood out to me uh, so much. Uh, the controls are also kind of interesting, and in, at least. From what I could tell, it's a two-player game. Tiffany and I are both playing it. And I believe we both have to use the same control scheme. And I think the control scheme is maybe not 100% intuitive in that it feels almost like you're using tank controls when you're using the vacuum or any of your tools. And that, I think, is a carryover from even the original game. I've, I've played just a little bit of the original Luigi's Mansion, and I remember uh, using the uh, Poltergust, I think is what they call it. Uh, it is like, it is definitely in that like tank control uh, type of control scheme, and I, I did not like it very much. Or I, found it, I found it uncomfortable at first. I don't know if it gets easier over time. Regardless of what tool you're using, if you're using a tool and you raise or lower your controller or tilt the controller up or down, that control controls the vertical movement of the mm. tool, regardless of what control schematic you have. But you cannot control it uh, on a horizontal scale, like left or mm-hmm. right, and uh, however you move the controller. Uh, so it kind of reminds me of Splatoon in that regard, uh, but only you- in, in the terms of motion controls. Do you like the sensitivity of the motion controls as they exist? It seems fine. I don't think there's no, a way to adjust it, but I don't think you would need to adjust it. And and right. really, when you get down to it, like you basically only need three, three directions, vertically speaking, that uh, that you'd use your tools in, like level, up, up and or down. down angle. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So like you obviously can go in between those. It, it's like a fluid motion, but. I don't think there's ever a point in time that you would need to not be all the way up and not be level. Right. Up max and down max are the same as like 45 degree angle between down and level, right? Exactly. And based on okay. the, the flashlight's uh, angle of use or the suction's angle of use, like there's really no problem with being slightly off from max up or down at that matter. Like it's always going to, there's a lot of forgiveness based upon the direction that you are using your your tools. Uh, but what I think gets me about the controls is at least when you're playing in two player, where sometimes the focus of the camera is not going to be as close to your character because you're in two player mode, it can be mm-hmm. kind of hard to see exactly what direction you're in if you're facing the left or the right. You, you might just be based off of your flashlight or the suction animation, think that you're maybe 30 degrees off from direct left or direct right, but you can't mm-hmm. always tell if you're aiming to- in the foreground or background. And that can sometimes make the tank controls a little trickier. But I also think that if you're someone that doesn't use motion controls, that if you're in the hor- uh, the uh, the more arcadey control scheme, it can be kind of hard to force yourself to use the motion controls to aim uh, up and down, because otherwise, in that control scheme, you wouldn't have that option. But at the same time, I, I do want to like praise the game, because that strafe or lack of strafe button, or not strafe button, if you will, uh, enables you to actually do a lot of small fine movements where if you can't tell in what direction you're uh what direction you're currently facing you can always use the non-strafe button combination or lack of to move in the direction that you know you need to be facing and that can save you a lot there so even Mm. my criticisms of the controls are actually kind of more a uh a highlight of how the control scheme actually enables you to find your way to play the game better. 
puzzles are always like pretty pretty logical but there can sometimes be a few tricky things that if you're not looking at it in the right way or you're not using the right tool it can kind of stump you for a bit but i kind of find that as like a nice positive i don't think we've ever hit something that we just couldn't figure out ever and even then like even if there are things that you've missed there are ways that you can use the in-game currency i feel like it's a uh, a shame that I have to specify in-game currency as opposed to microtransactions. You, using like the coins that you find in the game, you can purchase essentially like radar charges to find hidden items or hidden other collectibles that I won't really get into here. Uh, and overall, like pretty fun. So you can like buy hints essentially? More or less. It, it, at least it seems like you're buying charges. Like so you have to find gems which the gems change based on what the floor is and what their theme is. Okay. So I think there are six gems per floor. And if you can't seem to find... If you're, if you're having troubles finding a gem, you buy, I think, what is called like a gem radar or something like that. And it automatically marks the gems that you've missed so far. And I think you need to buy a given number of gem radars or whatever the actual item is called in order to have more than one gem show up on your map. Okay. So one more question. Are they using the gem radar? Like when you use the gem radar on the occasions that you've had to, do you ever feel like after it reveals or <laughs> like gives you that hint or suggestion that your internal response has been like, oh, okay, or that makes sense and not in the realm of like, if I didn't have this radar, I would have never found that. Or like, th this was this was impossible without the use of this item. So I might be wrong with what the item name is called, because I'm I'm going to say that it's not something you actually end up using. It's just done automatically and it shows up on your map. Okay. But to answer your your second question, I think most of the time it's only just given us an idea of like we need to look a little closer, look closer. at this room. Okay, I like that. The one instance instance that sticks out to me is one of the first rooms. And it, it was it was a type of situation where there's no way we would have found it without knowing that there was something we needed to do in this room. But luckily, after playing the game far enough in and learning new mechanics, getting and then getting that radar, we returned to this room and after maybe like five minutes of hunting around we figured out through the use of the mechanics we were taught later on in the game how we could reveal a crystal that we otherwise would not have had the knowledge to get. Oh, I really like that. Actually. So I, I don't want to talk it up too much because I think it's one of those circumstances where we just happen to play the game the way that the creators or the developers like wanted you to play the game. Right. And the game is open enough that if you hadn't have done this, you might have figured it out just by brute forcing your way through it or whatever the case may have been. Not to like say the game's force. like non-linear. I think there is a very specific path you go, but the collectibles right. the uh the point in time in which you get the collectibles is entirely up to you. You could do it right at the start, you could do what you can find and then move on and then go back to them later, or you could skip everything and come back to it later. Oh, well, it reminds me a little bit like a, uh, like that's the format of Metroidvanias that I like a lot for the collectibles or bonus items, or even just like uh, items or currency that doesn't have as much value or use until late game, like learning, learning tricks or acquiring new techniques or items to, activate or access it but for advanced players someone going back through on a second playthrough uh like there's accessibility to it well well before maybe the yeah the developer intended uh interaction so i have a question for second player are they using guiji yes does does guiji show up in cut screen cut scenes uh Depends on the cutscene. If there's a reason for Guiji to be there, then yes. But sometimes Guiji will... I mean, Guiji will banished. always technically show up because Guiji goes back into Luigi's backpack thing, his vacuum. Mm -hmm. 
his Kerbal vacuum. Uh, so technically, you're always visible. It's just a matter of like there are certain cutscenes that required you to use Guiji to a, a complete something, and in that case, Guiji will absolutely be present. Otherwise, Guiji goes in the backpack. But at least Guiji doesn't mystically disappear. <laughs> right. At least not. I mean, it, it never has really stood out that much to me. And to be honest, uh, your focus on the game in the cutscenes, I don't think is hardly ever on Guiji or Luigi unless they want you to look at them. Uh, which, it, this kind of gets me to my next point of praise for the game. And that is that. And maybe this is par for the course, I, I should say. But like, as someone that really appreciates character building and development and narrative and story, it's all, it always amazes me when I play like a game that you can tell the Nintendo development team put a lot of time and effort in polishing because there's basically zero dialogue. I mean, there is dialogue, but there are scenes where there is zero dialogue for like 15 minutes and yet you get so much depth and detail and impression, I should say, of what a character is just based upon the animation, the character designs, the movements, the implied or like the actions of the fight or whatever, the encounter. And I, I think that maybe Luigi's Mansion has like a leg up because it's such a cool setting compared to like other Nintendo games. But I feel like this is a golden example of Nintendo storytelling and it's like at its best. Nice. And it's, yeah, this is a case in which it's not just environmental, but your idle animations are even giving you context. Yeah. Yeah. I so, mean, that's cool. That's something you don't get. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to ask if it was a, um, a couch co-op must have in a, see of not very many couch co-op games yeah that's a good question yeah i think so i i think it's i think it's a good like cross between fun co-op gameplay and a story or something you can watch together i i like mm -hmm. it's not like the story is super complex or anything uh don't don't get me wrong it's not like you know this is going to be this the second coming of steins gate <laughs> it's just it's just like in an enjoyable little experience where you can root for Luigi, the underdog. Uh, you get to see his ghost dog, which I don't know which game. Apparently, Luigi's Mansion th uh, 2, because yeah. he's not in the first one. And you, you just get to kind of see like all of these interesting ghost entities that you meet and their behaviors and... I guess like the little stories you get from each one as you play the game. So, you know, let's say Overcooked. That's a really fun co-op game, I'd say. Overcooked is, a... is maybe like a better co-op experience in terms of the cooperation involved to get through levels and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I think Luigi's Mansion is like way more chill and you get like a fun, interesting story. Final Gooigi question, or at least on my end. He's made of goo, and he's supposed to like somewhat replicate uh, Luigi's a bit. Like he has, he has the same, I assume, like movement and basic uh, toolkit as Luigi. But obviously, some like there's some distinct differences, right? I've seen the trailers where he can like walk through bars or do other slimy, gooey things. Does his, how does his vacuum work? Because he has a vacuum too, right? Or he has a he has a vacuum vacuum it's, does that actually have suction or does it shoot goo in a stream like i don't understand how he has suction with it it's basically the exact same thing uh as you allude to there are things that guiji can do differently or mm -hmm. that he responds to differently it seems to be a lot of give and take there's pros and cons to guiji you can go through bars and vents and stuff like that and that's required to get through certain puzzles Right. You can go through drains and anything that liquids could do, but you can't use most ladders or other certain obstacles uh, that Luigi can use because mm -hmm. you would just phase through the ladder. And likewise, right. if there's like a catwalk uh, or like a vented walk path or something, Luigi can't move over or move 
over that catwalk. He'll just slide through it. So to move him, you have to... You, you If you're player one and player two is Guiji, you have to pick up player two, essentially. And yeah, you'd have to go back into the backpack or back into his vacuum and then who, tread yeah, across... Who, who initiates nice. that? Is it is it like I'm thinking Super Mario Bros. U, where you can pick up a character and throw them in a hole, or <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> even like Yoshi's? I think it's Yoshi's. Uh, it's not Epic Yarn. That's Kirby's Epic Yarn. But Yoshi's Woolly World, Woolly where you World. can yeah, you can eat a Yoshi and lay an egg of them, and then like throw them into a pit. I'm. I know I'm I'm talking about all the <laughs> terrible things I've done in Mario Co-op, but is it Oh don't worry, Neil does those same things. <laughs> is well, it is it player two's like is it their um consent or are they just getting <laughs> gooped like sucked back into the backpack at, at any point in time that player one decides they want to do that? Uh, uh it, it's only in the control of Gooigi when they want to leave the backpack or go into the backpack or whatever you want to okay. call it. The goo chamber. Uh, and on that point, like there's very little his ego that the two players can do to each other to interrupt each other. Like the only thing you can really do is flash the other with a flashlight, mm -hmm. and that can interrupt certain actions. But generally speaking, like it has to be pretty unlucky to find yourself doing that. Um, right. It's it's definitely developed in which cooperation towards a goal is is 95% of the interactions. Right. Okay. Guiji also has a flashlight? Yes. It's part of the uh bioluminescent goo vacuum. Okay. I don't ask questions about how it works. <laughs> I I've got a problem with all this goo doing stuff it shouldn't. But... Oh, and I should also note that uh Guiji also has like a much lower health bar. Ah. So 25 HP instead of 99. Oh. But if Guiji loses it, Guiji just has to wait like for a very low cooldown before coming back out from the goo compartment backpack thing. So there, there's not really like. But I don't think there's ever a situation Gooigi? where one is better than the other, or a, there's never an overall consensus that one character is better than the other. There, right. There's only situations. There's there's a fair balance. Does that mean that? A copy of Guiji is the same as the original Guiji. If I take one piece of goo and exchange it with a new piece of goo, <laughs> after I've traded out every piece of goo, is that the same Guiji? I don't think Guiji has an identity to begin with, though, because like there will be points. He has in times a name, and where... you're saying he has a personality. <laughs> what what more do you want? It, it's just that like. The the one thing you'll know is that I could open up... So I'm playing as Guiji. I could open up a cupboard that then has a jump scare on it. And the jump scare will affect Luigi across, like all the way across the room. But Guiji is unfazed. Like, I don't think Guiji... Guiji's just got ice in his veins. <laughs> so Guiji's like, uh, oh, that's fine. Stone Cold Killer. So I understand the idea of like anything that has a name has an identity... I guess we're not getting. Oh, this doesn't necessarily c conflict with the 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 ship question. I can't remember that. Yeah, I forget the name. I think it's Odysseus's ship is the uh, the the philosophical quandary that I posed against you, which is unfair, but it was fun. <laughs> I, I guess and the only that retort matters. is that when you die as Guiji, it's not like the goo is dis. Uh, disintegrating or being destroyed, it just returns, it returns back to the backpack. Okay, so, so it really just loses its like corporeal form for a moment. It just reaches a viscosity that is no longer able to maintain a human shape. I'm yeah, I'm enjoying it. Okay, and in uh, fact, I'm enjoying it so much. I didn't play Death Stranding uh, yesterday, so. I mean, you've proud actually, of you. yeah, you've actually pitched this quite well. I may pick it up for uh, Sierra and I to play. We haven't played a good cooperative game since uh, Portal Two allows you to like, if you don't cooperate well, just slay your uh, partner over and over <laughs> into you know puddles of water or crush them with spikes and whatnot. And so, took a toll on our relationship. And, oh. and it sounds like it sounds like there's a lot less. Uh, 
like of a that. lot less flexibility for fuckery between two people, which makes it the perfect co-op game for us. One with very like very hard built constraints to prevent <laughs> griefing. Tiff did point out that I constantly shoot a plunger onto Luigi's head, <laughs> onto her head. So, but there's nothing, there's nothing uh, detrimental about that behavior. Are you satisfied with playing Guigi? That means that means I think right that Tiff is is technically taking the like the first player, player or the uh, yeah the like more commanding character space right for, like she's she's sure. taking the primary role and and guiji although uh obviously an essential portion like i think it's fair to argue from the context we have now like you're playing a secondary role for sure but it feels very satisfying still yeah for sure there are bosses that would require you as a single player to use guiji specifically and mm. vice versa there are bosses at, at least there has been one specific boss where part of me was just thinking, like, I think this would be much easier if I just There's went no back Luigi? into the backpack. Yeah, because uh, because of a variety of things. But hmm, okay. um, so I, I I can't say for sure yet, since I I'm guessing we're probably maybe halfway through the game, if not even that far. But it seems like there, you no, know, we have four people to save out of five. So like, it feels like we've made a lot of progress based upon the floors, but. <laughs> Of the five main objectives, which is to save five people, we have only saved one. Uh, so I could be wrong. We could we could be halfway, or we given by the number of floors that we have explored, or we could be like twenty percent of the way uh, through this game. It's difficult to tell with some of those, right? Like the Metroid Prime games, you've discovered all but like say one area. Um, with like 25 or 30 percent of the game completed on some of them but then all of the backtracking and like additional navigation through these areas you find extra stuff like when you get your map is it you're filling in like room by room or you just get like an overview or are we talking about like the map is uh the map is complete but skeletal or like empty until you fill it in through access. Like, do you, un do you know how much is remaining of the areas and have I, you ever discovered anything that's like, it wouldn't show up say in the blueprints or the map of the game because it's a secret or like hidden area or passage. I actually don't remember Tiff. So basically it's like, you'll have, wait, are you playing it without me right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, you are the secondary role. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's getting some gems we didn't get. Okay, so the the map essentially is what you would find in a hotel floor plan if you want to think of it that way. Okay, it gives you all like all of the main rooms and stuff, but that doesn't necessarily tell you if there are secret rooms. So, like that. Take yeah, take that for what it's worth. You will be given essentially all of the information, all of the the layout information as well as like where doors are and you'll get things like what's not accessible or what's accessible, but you won't always have uh, information regarding secret paths or secret rooms or compartments. Okay. I like that. Just in case. So you can't memorize the map. I don't want any spoilers for you. <laughs> oh, we're past that point. Right. Right. Now, uh, that said, um, I would say that this is maybe speculation, but I have a feeling this game might actually get relatively difficult if you were j just playing by yourself. Yeah. Uh, partly because of some of the battles and bosses where you have to rely on Guiji. Like... It, Without giving spoilers or anything like that, you basically have to put Luigi in position, in vulnerable positions, and then use Guigi to, like, get an counter attack. Hand. Okay. But the very nature of that implies that you need to be comfortable enough switching between the two characters, and I'm not sure necessarily if that's very easy, given that we've never been switching. You know, we're we're uh, constantly two bodies, so. It's an interesting thought. Uh, but yeah, I, again, I don't necessarily want to like make you feel like this is a masterpiece, but I think I went in with like reasonably 
realistic expectations of the game and the game has been able to exceed those thus far yeah and and i mean i i can't name too many nintendo games i've played that i've ever been disappointed with by the end of uh normally normally the the nintendo like ips are kind of a seal or stamp of approval that I'm satisfied with as long as it's not a Donkey Kong game. And that's just because I can never get to the end. I just, I don't, we can make a whole Tropical episode about so why good. I have never been a fan of Donkey Kong. Because it's too damn hard. I don't even think it's too hard. It, okay, go back and play Donkey Kong Country for me and then tell me it's not too damn hard. The only way I beat that game is when the when the Super Nintendo uh, Classic came out and you could essentially rewind after all of your deaths. Th- this is That's all the assuming... Cheap, cheapest fucking game I've ever played. I this, mean... <laughs> I mean, like, the biggest problem with Donkey Kong is that the hitboxes are so... Huge huge but not it's like it's really hard to know what is part of the hitbox and what isn't and i think the game would be easier if they just removed the graphics and showed you (laughs) colored bitmaps like like just no honestly i get it yeah my blue rectangle would give me way more information than look at donkey kong's like sprint animation and their jump animations are so inconclusive too. Like what yeah. is like the flailing high arm are you? part of my hitbox? Or well, this time it is, but l- that last time it wasn't. <laughs> right. And that's that's kind of why I feel like a lot of people it, it's that and the momentum of Donkey Kong's movement that feels Are you saying gorillas are not graceful enough for you? <laughs> I I, like honestly, I think it's easy enough to get used to, but like if you're used to playing Mario and games like there is a certain degree of platformer momentum that has become like the universal acceptance and donkey kong doesn't follow it and donkey kong mm-hmm. just doesn't feel good most of the time uh, yeah we, we don't need to make this its own thing mm-hmm. moving on what have you guys been up to well i've been playing two new games one is a game that i've been whipping people into shape did I actually talk about this on the podcast last week, Scott? Is this no. Ring Fit? Yeah, if we're talking about Ring Fit, this is the first time. No, no. Me whipping other people into shape, i.e. Pistol Whip. Oh, I don't actually think you spoke about it on the podcast last time either. I'm almost certain okay. that was just that was, well, that was private convo. Cool. So Pistol Whip is a game <laughs> on... No, I did not talk about Pistol Whip. Uh, so Pistol Whip, VR game... It's the thing that's supposed to, at least people are starting to like tote that it is the next best game in VR, i.e. Beat Saber, Mm -hmm. that everyone should play. And my God, yes. It is so much fun. It puts you in the middle of an action sequence of just shooting people and beating them with a pistol to the beat and it is spectacular like i can say that i do have some pretty good vr legs so i don't get motion sick a lot from like things passing by but there was a game called rhythm rider that just recently came out or rhythm something where you had to basically feel them feel the beat and match your hands up with some dot dot locations but everything was kind of coming at you too fast. It was just like, okay, this makes me very nauseous. Refund. Pistol Whip found like the perfect amount of speed for things for you moving through the world. So like things coming at you, i.e. Beat Saber, that's not bad. Um, being like inside of a cockpit really does help having like a thing that's constant. But the way that Pistol Whip moves you through the world feels completely natural uh so you are using your full body to not only aim to shoot people but you're also going to be having to like duck out of the way of bullets you're dodging dodging pillars that are going to be in your way so you're dodging left and right and ducking and it is great um the shooting mechanics feel nice i did get to try it without the aim assist on 
And my God, that makes it so much harder. The aim assist is a godsend. It's a very, it's a very um, forgiving aim assist. To where the game kind of the game kind of um, scores you in a couple of different ways. You get a hundred points just for shooting a person. You get a hundred points for shooting a person on beat. So you get to you get two hundred points basically. Now with the aim assist on, those amount of points that you get are going to be lessened by how much the aim assist actually had to help you. So I've gotten as little as like three points basically because it's like. I wasn't really aiming at him, but you shot him anyway, and it's fine. I'll take it. He's dead. He's not shooting at me anymore. Because in every level, like you get two consecutive hits of being shot at, being shot, and then that ends the run for you. Otherwise, you can shoot like six or seven guys, or pistol whip six or seven guys, and then your armor will come back. Right. Yeah. Your body has pushed those bullets out of itself. It's ready for another yes. round. But it definitely makes you feel like a certified badass, just like listening to the thumping music, constantly having your gun up in front of you and just like just looking for that little bit of movement from that enemy coming around the corner. Because as soon as you see him, you shoot him. And it's great. So that's just been me um, pistol whipping people into, into shape. And then I also did, yes, pick up Ring Fit Adventure. Mm-hmm. Which... Where's the, your ring? Ac- it's right here. Okay. The actual ring con is it's got a nice rubberized um like I don't know how this thing works. It's magic though, but it's basically a a somewhat pliable plastic that connects to your Joy-Con and it can measure how hard you're pushing it in or how far you're pulling it out. Mm -hmm. And I haven't gotten any further than when I was talking with you privately, Scott, but the exercises they're having you do kicked my ass for like the very first thing. So my very first session was just the 10 minute exercise thing. Um, You are constantly jogging and are running to actually move, so there's a Joy-Con strapped to your leg and a Joy-Con in the ring. Um, so to move forward, you quite literally have to move your legs. And it is not going to take just some wimpy, like, I kind of just barely move my legs to go. You actually need to, like, jog in place. And to climb stairs, yes, your knees are going to have to get higher than you actually think they need to be. Have you tried to fool the game at all? I have not tried to fool the game at all. But I will tell you about halfway through fighting the like boss of the first like workout level session. You were tempted to. I was definitely attempted to because it was just like I don't want to do any more squats. These fucking oh my god, I'm so tired. <laughs> my legs felt like jello. <laughs> can can you squeeze that ring again for me? Yeah, you are squeeze, squeezing it so much. Yeah, it's it's uh his his fists are connecting. They've covered the what would you say that ring is about a foot in uh diameter? I think so. Yes. <laughs> it's a good amount of resistance. <laughs> I mean, we can definitely tell for listeners who can't see it when Cookie goes to squish the ring together. Uh, first off, he's making the I'm definitely putting effort in here face, but you can see that his hands like can't keep a completely even grip. They're slipping. Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna punch himself in the <laughs> he's face. He's gonna break it. Uh, yeah, no, oh, I don't think so. I don't think I can break this thing. Like, so one of the things you have to do to block a move is do an ab press. So you hold the ring con sideways and you press it against your abs. So that i can obviously get more leverage on your abs does of not. steel are how you defend yourself ah so yeah no this thing can completely touch itself and it is just fine huh i'm i'm really impressed with the like with seeing someone actually manipulate the materials who's not doing it for an ad yeah because the ads all show people like bending it maybe inches at that Bending it together inches, pulling it apart like 
inches. Okay. Insignificant mm. amounts of I need to take distance. off my jacket. <laughs> Guys, he's already gotten sweaty. The ring fits doing its job even when it's not uh, connected to the switch. <laughs> oh my God, I'm like, I'm glistening. <laughs> um, but nah, so yeah, it really, really works, your, works you out. So since you have a Joy-Con on your thigh, one of the things, the exercise that I have unlocked are the overhead press, which is you hold the ring con above your head and you squeeze it in to work your um your pecs. upper yeah your upper pectorals your uh, and then you let it go lats yeah yeah then you've got a which that one's not that bad but it's got a one thing cooldown so you can't just constantly keep doing that then you've got the squats and since you have a joy con that's been calibrated on your leg it knows that you're not squatting it knows <laughs> And it's like, nope, get a little lower. Get low. Yeah, there you go. Okay, now release. Where on the thigh is it? It's Mid about, thigh, right? Uh, it's about halfway between your, like, halfway up. A little bit higher than halfway up after your knee. Between your, yeah. And so they're like, get a little bit lower. It's fine. Then they've got the chair pose. Which that was the one I kind of was tempted to um to cheese by actually just sitting in a chair. <laughs> but you have to like you have to do the squat as if you are sitting on a chair and then you have the ring above your head and then it measures how quickly or slowly you bring the ring down and put the ring up while in that ridiculous pose. And it hurts. And then they've got the knees to chest, which is you laying on the ground and actually like Okay, so hiking your legs up. What is there actually a story? So that, the story that's not is, like a throwaway. The Ring Fit Kingdom has been attacked by the sloth demons, and you have no, to no, no, no. So you are a stranger who sees a who hears a ring call out to you to break it. Mm-hmm. To he's basically the ring is like. Set me free. The whole kingdom could be in danger and you'd never know. Set you should set me free. So you pull on the ring con as hard as you possibly can, and then it breaks the seal. And you release this muscle bound um demon who is very angry at being trapped in the ring for so long. And it turns out from what I've from what I found out, the demon is all about working out and being buff and strong. But he's so into it, he puts out negative energy into the world. Wait, so he's a workout party. He's a toxic gym bro. He's a toxic gym bro. So his workout buddy, who was actually the ring, who is now your workout buddy, was like, I'm not strong enough to seal him in anymore. I'm going to need your help. But we need to be in sync in order to to seal his uh, negative powers away. And the only way to get in sync is to exercise together. Your BMI is still around 20%. I don't think we're in sync enough. <laughs> so I, I do know that apparently you get to buy and create different kind of smoothies as power-ups. But I haven't gotten that far yet. Mm. But yeah, so basically you got a toxic gym bro who's been released onto the world causing toxicity around the world by being extra buff and making people not want to, I guess maybe they all want to be buff buff. Maybe they don't want to just be like him because he's just the annoying gym bro. But yeah, so it's up to you and you and your ring ring. I forget what his the rings name is, but you and the ring who is your workout buddy to go ahead and slap that gym bro into submission and resale him back up he was complaining about like he's like oh man back when you were my partner you used to say if you're if you don't work out every day yada 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 but man you kept me locked in there for so long i'm so weak now what's up with that bro (laughs) is there a customization for your ring fit avatar or do you have to play a fiery ponytail lady or fiery hair dude so there is a customization to your avatar but you are going to be fiery head. <laughs> right, right. But you don't have to be fiery uh, ponytail white woman, fiery hair white guy, right? 
Nah, nah, I'm fiery hair black guy. Nice. Okay. But yeah, is so there enough, ever there's... a point where they bring Sonic in? Because I feel like there's some obvious tie-in that they could have done. You do, yeah, you put the you, rings for a running training. Oh, oh man, oh that, yeah, that well, too. that and the the infatuation with rings here. No, that'd be great. Honestly, God, that'd be a, that'd be a great character. Maybe who knows? I doubt it. Actually, Sonic Sega. <laughs> Sega's not Se- owned, Sega's. but kind of <laughs> tied basically with owned by Nintendo. S- Sega's uh, now like Nintendo's little brother. Yeah, except but, when yeah. it comes to like Atlas shit, some of their. Well, no, I That's guess true. I guess Sega just publishes Atlas's stuff. They do. Oh yeah, I guess you're right. They do. But no, this game is um, I've heard from uh, like reviewers that it is a nice light workout. I've heard from like my thing into actually buying this. One of my friends who no longer lives in Omaha, like posted on Facebook. He's like, "Man, I he- did the intro level, and fuck me." <laughs> He got too fit for for the city, and he had to leave. You're telling me the GameSpot employees that have their own personal gym and like company provided trainers are not finding Ring Fit Adventures to be that excruciating? And yeah. then typical Joes that probably play more video games than do physical activity are having a tougher time with it. <laughs> what? Oh my god! <laughs> no, um, I'm actually kind of a... curious about it now. No, it's. It's a good workout. I think Lizzie was actually at book club for my first like workout set. Mm-hmm. So besides like having she the, didn't hear all the crying. <laughs> besides <laughs> having the um, resistance loop, but I'm thinking we can probably like simulate that somehow. She said she wants to join me because a lot of the things that we're doing that I'm doing literally are just squats and mm-hmm. leg lifts. So and she can run in place with me, and that's no problem. Um. But no, it's a it's a good workout. There's a YouTube video of this guy trying to literally speed run it. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love that concept, honestly. I'm curious about it from the standpoint of like I'm probably in the in the worst shape I've ever been in my life. And I'm as def- you eat, is that a cookie or this a cracker? This is a ginger snap. <laughs> okay, this is this is a ginger snap cookie, all right? <laughs> so, so, yes, <laughs> so I'm curious. Munch, munch. I've definitely, I'm definitely at my highest, uh, weight, my heaviest and it, like my worst shape. Uh, right. Your largest internalized ginger snap. Uh, <laughs> I am the biggest gingerbread man ever <laughs> I, that I have ever been. So I'm curious if this could actually like promote me to get back into better exercise habits. Like, mm-hmm. but I think one of the big things that would be a driving point for me is if I can actually enjoy the story within the game um, I, I find that i find that like hard to believe I'm, but i haven't seen it. it it's not like it has to be it it doesn't have to be a masterpiece like luigi luigi's mansion 3 is by no means a complex story but it's still very enjoyable yeah you still like it every miyazaki movie is really not that complex when you think about it like, but you still like it. Well, not every Miyazaki movie, but like a lot of Miyazaki or Studio Ghibli movies are not that complex. Kiki's Delivery Service is, hey, I'm a little girl witch. I'm delivering packages. Oh, I like this boy, and now he's falling. God damn it. I am going to like Death Stranding, aren't I? Fuck. Uh, dude, I love I don't Kiki's know. Delivery Service. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Quick aside. I've heard a lot of polarizing things about the game, or I've heard that people, a lot of people don't like the game. But well, I think it's... people have taken on a very unrealistic expectation for what Death Stranding was going to be. And I think the same people, for the same reason that a bunch of people got really upset over what Metal Gear Solid Five turned out to be, which was like a kind of incomplete game that was all about like open world infiltration and not much more. Yeah, it was much more mechanically like dense than say metal gear solid four right like you could totally say that if you look at the distribution of effort there's way more distribution to the story and cutscenes in four and that that amount of like time or development went into interactivity in metal gear solid five and it it could be the exact opposite in this game i have a feeling this is going to be a return to mgs 4s like story focus in which case like the same people that thought metal gear solid four was way too much story, are going to be super pissed off that they're playing this game instead of MGS5's, you know, spiritual successor, which hasn't been made yet. 
so but from the reviews i've been reading of this game and listening to the story doesn't pick up until the very very end and then the game completely flips itself on its head let's it not go any further into death yeah. i don't want to hear about no whales beaching themselves okay okay i apologize but yeah so i hear that the i hear that it's a walking simulator <laughs> and i saw walking simulator and Man, since you mentioned you Kiki's Delivery Service, I kind of low-key want to play Walking Simulator now. Thanks. Dude, uh, if you haven't played Firewatch, you should give that a shot. I think that's a pretty oh, yeah. good walking simulator. Oh, Firewatch is a good walking simulator. Oh, you've actually already played it? Like, you should play Virginia, then. I don't want to play Virginia. You, should, just, you should play Proteus, then. You should play... Uh, I'm trying to think of other... The, the Dear Esther. The Vanishing of Ethan Carter is supposed to be a really good walking simulator. Well, you I don't should. really want a walking simulator. I want a package delivering simulator now, though. Did uh, you did you hear about the one, uh, the game that's in development where you are a Japanese postal worker? No, but this sounds like papers, please, and I'm excited. Tiffany no. told me about this game, and uh, I might not be able to find it anymore. A Japanese postal worker game. Speaking of Japanese postal worker game, After Party came out, but it's not out on Switch yet, and that makes me sad. Is After Party the game that's made by the Oxenfree team? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, Inaka Project. Postal delivery game Inaka Project has you deliver exploring the Japanese countryside. Uh, by train, by motorbike, or on foot, you'll be able to explore this lovely place at your own pace and however you wish to do it. Little information on the game is available right now, but the developer has many short clips of the charming places you'll visit, as well as some of the people you can meet on their Twitter accounts. Inaka Project is currently in development, but you can follow its creation on the developer's Patreon. Anyways. Uh, Ooh, it's 3D. This looks nice. So just to verify, Scott, you, you didn't talk about The Outer Worlds last week, I, right? I did talk about The Outer Worlds yes. last week. Actually, we put a like pretty oh, big I chunk of it. time yeah. into it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, last week was very Outer worlds -y. And, and okay. I'll have plenty more to say on The Outer Worlds uh, probably the next time we record. But luckily, I didn't make much headway this week. So hey, I, me neither. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't uh, miss out on any opportunities to talk on it in the pod today. The Outer Worlds. Uh, Neil, if you haven't edited that episode, then you haven't heard me say, wow, it's nice to play a good Western RPG again. Whoa, you say but that after playing... Uh, Divinity Original Sin, which is also a great Western RPG. So, okay. I was going to say, yeah. you should have said, wow, it's great to play a great, a good Bethesda game. I, yeah, absolutely. No, I think I may have actually said that in I there. Think you did and as well. Yeah, <laughs> I, I definitely, w for you to appreciate Neil... Uh, played a little bit of Skyrim before I picked up The Outer Worlds, and it's just like the night and day difference between those two games, and even looking at <laughs> a dialogue interaction in Fallout 4, like, just, oh, it's it's very refreshing. It's very nice to see. I'll have to give it a shot. Yeah, Maybe, at, least, we'll see. at least look into it. It's Steam. I did I not, say. yeah, I did not expect to enjoy it as much as, uh, right, I didn't expect it to, like, be as delightful of an experience as it has been so far. Slash nail if you if you don't want to spend full price on it, literally just sign up for the that Game I know Pass. you hate I know you hate Xbox Game Store. Just sign up for Game Pass for a dollar. <sighs> Windows Store bar full we'll, we'll see. Okay. That's it for this episode. You can write us in to podcast app pod excuse me. You can, can write us in at podcast at fancyramen.com. <laughs> Do you like how I interchangeably came or spoke at the same time there? Yeah, I interchangeably I did came. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> uh, you can also check us out on Twitch at twitch.tv slash fancy ramen TV slash cookies milk slash J Frey all day. Congratulations, J Frey, for getting married yesterday. Ah, uh, congrats Oops. to John. Um,. Until next time, leave a review and all that stuff. Yeah, tell your friends about the podcast. Uh, I've been doing the legwork of telling folk about it. Why don't you uh, go ahead and help me out and do some of that too? <laughs> <laughs> okay. If Says I'm gonna, if, yeah, <laughs> if I'm gonna bother with all the promotion, someone else can help me out. <laughs> bye bye.
See you next week.